Good morning. I'm not sure if you guys appreciate just how subtle uh, uh, Jerry is over there on the piano, <laughs> but he just played you the bulletin cover. Uh, so that was just beautiful. Thank you so much, guys. And we're wonderful to have all our musicians here this morning. Uh, we are here to worship and praise. Uh, and um, I, I, sometimes we just need to remember that God is in our life. Can I get an amen on that? Amen. Well, uh, thank you all. Uh, there are a few things here. First, a welcome uh, to those of you who are watching the service online. Uh, we miss you, we love you, and we hope that uh, you feel our unity uh, even though you're not with us here in the room. And once again, we invite you to take Holy Communion with us and to sing along. Um, and if you're home alone, sing extra loud. Um, and we'll enjoy that together. For those of you who are in the room, we of course have our welcome pads that are at the end of the road, those little burgundy colored pads there. Be sure to write your name in, pass it down when it gets to the end pass it back and the other people can peek at it and figure out your names. So that's a nice little trick. Uh, every month we do uh, a mission support relief offering uh, and uh, we have our, our beautiful stained glass offering boxes up front here. All that money goes outside of our door. Uh, and uh, is it hot outside? See, I'm just, this is interactive. I'm making sure you're listening. Um, <laughs> Uh, and it is very hot for our homeless folks. Uh, and so uh, Grace Lutheran Church uh, does a beautiful mission uh, year round with the homeless, but at this time of year, we like to throw them a little extra support. Uh, they provide uh, relief from the heat uh, and support for the soul. So um, if you can help out with that, anything you put in these offering boxes, uh, you'll be all invited to come forward during our regular offering if you wish to make that donation. Uh, also coming up uh, is, uh, we love, love Jerry, uh, but one of the people that Jerry has got us connected with is Nicole Pesci. Uh, and many of you have heard she's a beautiful pianist, uh, and Jerry's arranged for her to be with us Sunday, July 10th. Uh, so you might want to uh, remember that and circle that on your calendar. Uh, and oh, I, I know there's another, oh here we are, there's more announcements on the back side. I knew I had a couple more. Uh, this one is very, very important, especially if you are uh, a, a visitor with us today. We got donuts. Uh, we have coffee and donuts, uh, and it's up the stairs right here in the fellowship hall, uh, and you're invited to join us today after the worship service for that. And lastly, um, we are still going through a time period where there is an abundance of refugees, especially from Afghanistan. Uh, and we are proud to work with Lutheran Social Services. And so our congregation has uh, volunteered to set up an apartment for a new family that's coming in. Uh, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's arranging furniture. And so if you'd like to play that little game on your phone where you're moving the chairs around and to, you know stuff like that, uh, you can do it for real. Uh, and you don't have to be muscular to do this. You could just have a good idea uh, where the forks should go and which drawer. Uh, so if you'd like to help out for that, uh, be sure to contact Tim Gaffney and you can connect with him through the church office. Um, but uh, with all that, like I said, we are here to worship. So would you please stand as we begin by confessing our sins to God. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Let us make confession in the presence of God and one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we have not followed your path, but have chosen our own way. Instead of putting others before ourselves, we long to take the best seats at the table. When met by those in need, we have too often passed by on the other side. Set us again on the path of life. Save us from ourselves and free us to love our neighbors. Amen. Hear the good news. God does not deal with us according to our sins, but delights in granting pardon and mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. You are free to love as God loves. Amen. We'll join in hymn 798. Will you come and follow me?
be with you. Let us pray together. Merciful Lord, we do not presume to come before you trusting in our own righteousness, but in your great and abundant mercies. Revive our faith, we pray. Heal our bodies and mend our communities, that we may evermore dwell in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Today's lesson is taken from the first book of Kings, chapter 19, verses 15 to 16, and 19 to 21. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint Hazel as king over Syria. And you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Sh Shaphat of Abba you shall anoint as prophet in your place. So he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him, and he was with the twelfth. Then Elijah passed by him and threw his mantle on him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Please let me kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. And he said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? So Elisha turned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slaughtered them and boiled their flesh using the oxen's equipment and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he arose and followed Elijah and became his servant. Word of God, word of life. Three, please rise. According to St. Luke, the ninth chapter. Glory to when the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him, but they did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another, he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. The Gospel of the Lord. You, you may be seated, and I would like to invite any children and youth who are present today to come on up to the front. If 
you would. I'm going to put this back on. I'm going to grab this. All right. Thanks for joining me, you guys. Anyone else? No? All right. So I want to talk a little bit about the first story that we heard. You know, last week's children's sermon, who was here last week? Last week's children's sermon was about hot dogs. This one is about oxen burgers. Anybody had an oxen burger before? Me either. I'm thinking maybe it tastes a little bit like a bison burger. That's my guess. But you think so? Yeah, I don't really know. I don't know, but it's about ox burgers. I want to talk about the first story we heard today that Miss Cece read because it's kind of a weird, cool story. And I'm not going to talk about it so much in the sermon, but it relates to the sermon. So I thought we should talk about it just a little bit. So we have these two main characters, Elijah with a J, ja, ja, ja. And then we have Elisha with a sh. And the way I remember to keep the difference, Elisha is the younger prophet, and it's sh, like you're shing a baby. So I think of Elisha as the baby prophet. And um, although he's not a baby in this story, he's a grown man. He's out, he's out plowing the field with his oxen, being a farmer, doing his thing. And Elijah, who's already a prophet, comes along and throws his mantle on Elisha. What's a mantle? Do you guys know? Oh, very good. Yeah, it's not like a fireplace mantle. Um, that would hurt, right? Not like a fireplace mantle. Yeah, it's like, yeah, it's a cloak, basically. It's a coat. It's, a, it's like a sweatshirt. Um, and he throws that on him. And why? I think you were onto something. You said it's kind of like this. What is that? What do you think he means by throwing his mantle on him? Here. No, tell us. To follow God. To follow God. Yeah. The mantle is, is the symbol of his role and his authority as a prophet of God. Just kind of like this is a symbol of, of the role and authority of pastor, right? So, so when he's throwing his mantle on him, it's kind of like, you know, it's, it's like if I handled, hand, handed my mantle to Caleb here, my, my stole, and said, hey, um, I'm about ready to be done with this job, so I'd like for you to take it over. Um, so have a sermon ready, okay? You ready for that? No, not quite, okay. Uh, but the, yeah, that's basically what he does. Uh, and he doesn't really ask Elisha if he wants the job. He, he just says, here you go. This is a job that God has given you. And Elisha's like, um, I'm here with my oxen. I'm in the middle of plowing my field. Uh, can you give me a little time to sort of take care of things and get my, get my house in order and say goodbye to some people and do some stuff? And Elijah's like, well, you know, I'm not stopping you. I'm not making you do anything. I just gave you my mantle. You do what you want to do. So he has a choice to make, right? I mean, have you ever been in a position where you had to give something up or leave something behind, something that you still kind of cared about? Yeah, you're nodding. You want to tell us? You want to give us an example? No? Anybody want to give us an example? No. But maybe sometime when, like, you had to move, maybe because somebody in your family had a new job, or, or you were just moving to a new house, or you went to a different school, and maybe there were things that were, that were good about that transition, but there were also things that you had to leave behind that you also cared about. Has that ever happened? Never? Some of you, some of you, I think maybe it has. Yeah, some of you can maybe think about times when that's happened. So, yeah, so... Elisha had some good stuff going for him. He had land, he had these oxen, he, you know, he had a, a future secured for himself, which wasn't all that common in those days. So he wasn't really eager to give that up, but God had a different idea for him and a different plan. So he didn't go quite all the way back home, but, but he did decide, you know what? Uh, it's time to be done. I'm gonna have to give, I'm gonna have to be done being a farmer. I'm going to have to be done with this life because God has something else in mind for me. And so what did he do? Right there, he had a barbecue for the whole, the whole community. Right there, he cooked up all of his oxen <laughs> and had a barbecue and fed them to everybody, uh, just using the tools that he had on hand. I don't know quite how this, how this happened. Like, like, he made, like he made a grill, I guess, uh, built a barbecue out of 
No, I think he boiled them. But anyways, he cooked up all the oxen right there and served all of his neighbors, and, and so he could be ready to do the next thing that God had for him. Pretty amazing, huh? So, you know, I wonder if sometimes he kind of missed, you know, like when he was sitting around waiting for God to tell him what to do next, if he kind of like, don't you think he kind of had, had times where he's like, oh, man, I miss my oxen. I wish I was back out in the field. I knew which direction to go. I knew exactly what to do next. I knew what my job was. And this is, I, this, I don't, I don't know, I'm not quite sure. You know, sometimes we move into something new and we're just not quite sure what's going to happen next. But what he did have was God's promise. Right? That God was going to be with him. That God was going to help him. That God was going to give him what he needed in order to do the job that God had for him. Is that promise true for us too? Even when we have to face, go do something new or face something that's kind of scary? Yes, or give something up that, you know, that we think we're going to miss? Yeah. So that's part of the, part of the story that you're going to hear today from Jesus too. But I just I wanted to tell you about Elisha and Elijah as well just so you don't go, throw, go around trying to throw the mantle on your, of your fireplace on somebody. But you can practice with a sweatshirt if you want. All right, should we say a prayer? God, we know sometimes in life you may ask us to give something up or to leave something behind or say goodbye to someone or something that's been important to us. Help us like Elisha to trust that you will still be with us and bless us and help us along the way. Thank you for all you do for us and thank you for allowing us to serve you. Amen. Thank you guys. You're awesome. I took it off the wrong way. For one of the most memorable transitions of my life, I actually had a narrator. I was uh, at college orientation, you know, the, the drop-off weekend where they have all the stuff for the, the families, the talks and the lunches and the things for the, uh, you know, the families that are dropping off their young person at college. And we had finally finished with all of that stuff, and it was my... It was time for my, my family to leave and, and, and go back to Medford and me to stay there on the campus in, in Salem, Oregon. And, and uh, you know, it was time for me to, me to walk into the cafeteria and have lunch, you know, find somebody to have lunch with. And my family was going to be leaving. And so I vividly remember, you know, those last hugs, those last, last goodbyes. And, uh, you know, and then turning to, to walk <laughs> into my new life all by myself, and I purposely did not turn around. I did not turn back because I was afraid, you know, that I would just, all that emotion would come to the surface and I would just end up in a, in a puddle in the middle of campus and I, you know, I wouldn't be able to take that step forward that I knew I needed to take and was ready to take and prepared to take. So I took a deep breath and I walked forward and somebody who was some bystander, probably some other parent who was, who was standing there, uh, you know, witnessing all these transitions unfolding in real time said, and off you go. <laughs> <laughs> Strikes me funny now at the time. It was, uh, it was very poignant at the time, and off you go. There are times when you can't look back, you know? There are times when you, when, you have to, when you have to just look forward and keep taking forward steps. Have you had a time like that? Have you had a time like that? Like what Jesus is, is, is calling these would-be followers to. Or, or then there's the story of Elijah with the kind of look back, right? Uh, but but the, the wrapping up and the immediate, sort of the immediate transition into something new, the... The, the ending of, of a significant 
uh, portion of his, of his old life, the leaving behind of, of, of everything that he's invested in and, and has valued. Sometimes the, the, those closing doors behind us are what pushes us forward. We've been reading about that in our Stephen ministry group. Sometimes the, the fact that going back is no longer an option is what, what propels us into something new, even though we don't know what going forward will look like. And it'll be quite some time before Elisha comes on the scene again to find out what this mantle really means. And it'll be quite some time, nearly 10 chapters in fact, before Jesus reaches his destination, this long, long travel, travel narrative that we have in Luke. But what we know is that his face is set toward Jerusalem. His face is set. That's such a great expression. Can you imagine what that face looks like? What does that set face look like? When I married a, a southerner, I became exposed to a whole lot of sayings, wonderful, um, uh, colorful phrases uh, to describe life situations. And one of these is, fix your face. Um, and I've learned that fix your face is most, m- most uh, often applied to um, a, a child who is uh, s- starting to use their face in a mani- manipulative fashion to get something that they're not going to get anyway. <laughs> No, you may not have ice cream. You did not eat your dinner. Fix your face. That kind of thing. (laughs) Fix your face. Um, And so I can't think about set your face without thinking about fix your face. Uh, But I I imagine this face that is fixed with, with love and with urgency and with surrender to the will of God. This is, the, this is the face that will ultimately look out over Jerusalem and, and uh, you know, even, the, even though, as my friend Pastor Kerry from St. Andrew said, Jesus isn't very cuddly in this passage. And that's true. There's a, there's a fierce determination, right, and, and focus that's a, that's a little unnerving um, and is downright offensive to some people. Uh, but, but also, this is the face that will look out over Jerusalem at the end of this travel narrative and and say, oh, Jerusalem, I wish I could gather you up like, like chicks underneath uh, a hen's wings, right? So there's this tenderness as well, this love and urgency and tenderness and surrender to the will of God in Jesus' face set. And, and not surprisingly, it's a look that both attracts and offends, right? It's a look that attracts some people. There are some people that, that see that, that sense of mission and purpose and, and uh, love and urgency, and they want to be a part of it. They want to be a part of it, maybe in kind of an idealistic, uh, grandiose fashion, but they, they're attracted to it, and they want to follow. And, and so there are those folks. And then there are also people who are, who are put off by it, who are offended by it, who, who can't quite handle it. Like this group of, of Samaritans in this first uh, village that he encounter, encounters. Now, it's important to remember that this is Jesus, not Jesus' only encounter with Samaritans. And, and so it's not meant to be a blanket statement about, about Samaritans uh, of all kinds. In fact, the text even sets it up to expect, expect him to be received with hospitality, right? They sent word ahead um, as if, you know, the village will be prepared to receive them and to welcome them, even though they are Samaritans. But these Samaritans are put off by his focus on Jerusalem. It's not their, their preferred site for holy worship. They, they believe Mount, Mount Gerizim is the holy place. It's not, it runs afoul of how they understand God's revelation and, and, God's, uh, and God's prophecy. And so the singularity of his focus on Jerusalem is something they can't, they can't embrace, they can't absorb, they can't play host to. And so James and John who are desperately eager to have their own authority validated somehow in this ministry business, right? They're the ones, can we sit sit at your right and your left hand when you come into the kingdom of God? I mean, doggone it, they want to feel powerful for once, right? We were following the son of man who casts out demons on command. Can't we just show them who's boss just for once? Can't we just show them how wrong they are for rejecting you? Can't we call down fire and consume them? Let's do that, Jesus. No. No. 
we're not going to do that. We don't even know what he says to them, just that he rebuked them. He wasn't going to entertain that kind of talk. Oh, come on. Can't we at least leave them a one-star review on Yelp? No. Fix your face. Fix your face. Let's keep moving. Vengeance isn't part of the program here. Reactivity doesn't serve the mission, which is to save people from their sin, not to show them who was right. At least that's what we have to assume, because Jesus has nothing more to say about the matter. He's already on to the next town. Where he does have something to say is to those who wish to be his followers. But first, but first, first, let me go and bury my father. And then we think, now, Jesus really doesn't want this man to go to his father's funeral, but it's more complicated than that. First, let me go and bury my father. So, because, you see, I'm the firstborn. He's not actually dead yet, but when he does die, um, I'm, I'm the firstborn, so I'm the one supposed to secure the inheritance, so I need to be there so I can secure the inheritance so that I know that I have a future for myself and my offspring and a place to retire when this is all over and maybe a backup plan if this thing doesn't work out with you. So uh, just as soon as I have all that straightened out, uh, then I would really like to follow you. To which Jesus responds with what I read as a parable. Let the dead bury their own dead. It it, it means to convey a sense of urgency in a bigger picture that the man is missing. You're worried about securing your temporal future. I'm working on securing your eternal future here. Yours and your dad's and your progeny and all of humanity. You're talking about slowing down to attend to the business of death and I'm on my way to defeat it. Don't miss the opportunity to be a part of that. And likewise, the one who says, but first, but first let me say farewell to those at home. Jesus is saying, I'm here to establish the kingdom of God. And as long as your face is set on what you've left behind, you won't be ready to receive it. It's interesting, isn't it? Interesting, isn't it, that the obstacle to ministry that Jesus is most concerned about, the one that that he takes the time to challenge, is not the outright rejection by opponents to his message. It's the but first of would-be followers. It's not the meanies he takes to task. It's the good-hearted, over-committed idealists who are tripping over their misaligned priorities. Whew. It's those of us who have said, yes, yes, I intend to continue in the covenant God made with me in holy baptism, to live among God's faithful people, hear the word of God and share in the Lord's Supper, proclaim the good news of Christ in, in word and deed, serve all people following the example of Jesus and strive for justice and peace in all the earth. I do and I ask God to help and guide me, but first, but first I, I, gotta, I gotta focus on getting done with school, right? <laughs> I gotta graduate. I gotta, I gotta find a job, build a resume, because you know who's gonna listen to what I have to proclaim anyway before I get those things done. But first, I, you know, I need to. I gotta pay off some student debt. I gotta get the kids a little older so they don't need me as much. Then I can think about serving more. Right? That's been mine for like the last ten years. About time to come up with a new one. But first, I gotta get through. I gotta get through the summer. The summer's so busy. And then I gotta get through the fall, because that's busy too. And then I gotta get through the holidays, and then I gotta get through the end of the school year, and then I gotta first I gotta retire, then I'll have more time to strive for peace and peace and justice in all the earth. I gotta I gotta do that first, but first, but first, but first let's let's form a committee and have a book study and attend a webinar and conduct a feasibility analysis so we can be sure we know exactly what he means and exactly what we're in for when he says follow me. I love all that stuff. I'm a Presbyterian. We love the sacrament of the Holy Committee. (laughs) And I know we all have real-world responsibilities, and many of them are God-given. I believe Jesus knows that, too. He wept when his friend died. I also believe Jesus is walking through our city streets with the same urgent love he carried for Jerusalem. Wanting to gather all the hurtful and hurting ones like chicks under his wings. Wanting us all to be free from the fear of death. 
free from the fear of messing up, free to embrace the life that's really life, and wanting people to join him whose faces are fixed and whose hearts are set on that same saving, healing mission. And somewhere, my friend, somewhere hanging on the desert breeze is a call to each of us and to all of us as a community to let go of some encumbrance, some yoke of the past, or some pressing obligation of the present, and step toward the kingdom of God. And the only thing standing in the way is our but first And he's not going to force you. It's a free country. We, we don't even know how the folks in this story respond, whether, whether they're sad or mad or glad, whether they decide to follow or they turn around, whether days or years down the road they're running to catch up with a call that has haunted them or they're sitting there wondering what might have been, or whether they are among those he will send out shortly with no bag and no sandals to tell people kingdom of God has come near. It's a free country, this kingdom of God. Not in the sense we typically think of, where I'm free to do or say whatever feels right to me, regardless of how it impacts you. But instead, it's a freedom from triumphalism and the need for vengeance. Freedom from attachments. A freedom to lean into hospitality freedom to follow. Jesus would free us to follow. May God grant us the courage to get off our BUTs and embrace our baptismal calling for the sake of a world in need. We have much to do, but first, the kingdom. Amen. Joined in hymn number 574, Here I Am, Lord, Please Rise. <laughs>
confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. People of God, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He is seated at the right hand. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated for the prayers. United in Christ and guided by the Spirit, we pray for the Church, the creation, and all in need. God of faithfulness, set the face of your Church firmly on you. Rooted in your self-giving love, may the Church find freedom in loving our neighbors. Hear us, O oh God. God of peace, guide all who govern, that they place the good of their citizens above self-promotion. Anoint leaders of nations with your spirit of neighborly love. Protect refugees and all who live under tyranny or conflict. Hear us, O oh God. God of kindness, reveal your healing presence to all who are ill, injured, or in need, especially Johnny Edwards, Mark Sterling, Susan Lefevre's family, Don Nola, Dominic Jarmilo, Anne Widness, George Humphrey, and Dennis Hagen. Provide support systems and loving companions as they work toward health, that they may rest in hope and know the fullness of joy in your presence. Hear us, O oh God. God of love, attend to those struggling with addiction and depression. Support the needs of any who are unemployed, hungry, or have nowhere to lay their heads. And be with those who are without access to adequate health care. May they find safety and self-worth in the shelter of your wings. Hear us, O oh God. God of joy, we give thanks for all who have died and now celebrate the inheritance of life in you. Uphold those who grieve. Comfort Barbara McDonald and her sister Patricia West upon the death of Patricia's son, Jason Zambon. Steve and Sue Frome and family upon the death of sister-in-law, Cookie Frome and Clarence and Todd Williams upon the death of their son and brother. Hear us, O oh God. God of every time and place, in Jesus' name and filled with your Holy Spirit, we entrust these spoken prayers and those in your hearts to your holy keeping. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us share God's peace with our neighbors.
as we collect our normal offerings, I also encourage you to give generously to Grace Lutheran Church. Join in hymn 721, Goodness is Stronger Than Evil. Please rise. Goodness is stronger than that we should everywhere and always offer thanks and praise to you, O God, through Jesus Christ, who by his death on the cross and glorious resurrection broke the bonds of sin and death and gave life to all creation. And so with the church on earth, all creation and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took a cup and gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Amen. Gathered to one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught us.
will join in I have decided to follow Jesus as printed in your bulletins. strengthen you and keep you in his love. Life-giving God, through this meal you have bandaged our wounds and fed us with your mercy. Now send us forth to live for others, both friend and stranger, that all may come to know your love. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The God of peace, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you and show you the path of life this day and always. Amen. Amen.
Thanks be to God. Thank you.